So I um so before we get started, let me just quickly share my desktop here. So we can see. Um, please feel free to let me know, Pallavi. I mean, if you can see my desktop. Yes, I'm OK, great. Yes, thank I'm you. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, so. Uh, oh, great. OK, sorry about that. Just give me a second. <clears throat> Yeah, that's better. OK, so automation huh, in technical documentation. Firstly, I again would like to welcome all of you here on this forum to the 42nd consecutive weekly event of technical writers type. Um, well, and then before I begin, Happy New Year to everyone. Happy Sankrantri, because uh, unless we speak or you know, I personally wish you all happy oh, Pongal, happy Kanuma, uh, wherever you are. Uh, you know, January is a great month. I look forward to it, not just because you know it starts a new year, but uh, because it brings in a lot of uh, enthusiasm and excitement. You know, you have a long year that you need to plan for. So I am Amandeep Singh Talwar, and uh, today I'll be sharing my views and experience regarding automation and technical documentation. I usually keep my LinkedIn profile updated, so I'll skip the introduction part. And uh, before I begin the session, I have a couple of disclaimers. Uh, one, the content of the information provided in this webinar is for your general information and use only. And this webinar also includes links to our resources and websites. Two, technical writing is not automatable. I personally believe that writing is difficult skill. It takes years to master the skill of making technical documents interesting and understandable. No automation can ever, ever replace this skill. OK, again, it could be possible that I may not be able to answer all your queries. You know, maybe during or after this session, so please feel free to send your queries to the TWT forum or reach out to me directly over my email address. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know you already are wearing your headphones or have your speakers turned on. But then please mute yourself and so that we can get started. So theory of evolution. Now, how many of you know this person? Anyone? Darwin. Great, thank you. Yes, that's Charles Darwin. Now, well, mm, you may ask, wait, did I join the wrong webinar? Or did I pick wrong slides? No, absolutely not. You're you're still in the right webinar, and this is definitely not a science presentation. So just stick around. Now there's an interesting story behind this slide. Uh, my son, he's in 10th standard, so I was helping him prepare for his pre-board exams. Uh, we were discussing the theory of evolution by Charles Darwin. Now for those who care for more details, Charles Darwin was a British naturalist who proposed the theory of biological evolution by natural selection. Now, Darwin defined evolution as descent with modification. The idea that species change over time, give rise to new species and share a common ancestor. This made me wonder how about I try relating this to you know how document evolved. Interestingly, there is a fit. So as you can see on the slide here, you know, it all started from carvings to the handheld devices that we you know, carry anywhere and everywhere with us today. There is definitely an evolution. Let us now continue with our idea of evolution and see the various stages of you know, how the document evolved. Starting from developing a document, it all started with a quill. People, you know, used you know, a quill to write uh, scripts. Then typewriter came into picture, moving on to computers. Voice, I love uh, my you know, Alexa, Siri and home. And then you know, somehow I started seeing you know, more of artificial intelligence you know, getting into picture. Well, that's definitely you know, a leap. But if you think that was enough, no wait. Look at the way you know these documents or help or information was shared in past. Basically, it all started with mass gatherings. You know, people would just go and speak to people, and that information was carried out word of mouth mostly. Then 
they started, you know, when books came into picture, you know, they were arranged in libraries. They were made available to people who can go and refer to them. Slowly, books took a uh, form of files on drives and disks that we can actually carry or, you know, you know, view at our leisure at homes using computers or devices. Then, you know, suddenly, you know, there was cloud everywhere. Everything was like pushed on cloud. You can now access that information. You can share that information. Uh, just upload it on cloud and then you know can be accessed over any device. Well, that's evolution again. Now let's talk about our favorite topic tools, right? And see if if there is evolution there. Well, of course, yes. You know, information initially was shared as form of stories, which was shared in mass gatherings that we've actually seen here. Then came scrolls and carvings. Usually that took the form of books. And then Maybe when I actually began my career, you know, it, it was there was a lot of thought about uh, authoring, structured authoring, how to probably arrange that information not in a form of a book, but in a much more structured author. Things change. We are mostly doing programming right now with data into picture, with most of our artificial intelligence playing a role in developing information. Programming did come into picture here. It's one of the tools. Now, my favorite technology. So from handwritten scrolls to print software and now cloud based help. Do you agree that there is evolution here? I say yes. Now it could be a couple of pointers that I'm, I'm, I must have missed here on this slide. There could be more, you know, more pointers here under development or tools, but look at the essence. It is just not the species that has evolved. Everything around him has, and that includes technical documentation. So if you're a technical writer, or if you are you know, new to this domain, and you're still thinking why I should care for automation, well, think again. So what we saw earlier was definitely broad and generic in nature. Like we were basically talking about, you know, the you know the documentation or information and how it was shared uh, in a more holistic way. Let us now narrow down our discussion to software documentation because we definitely need to talk about something in detail. So why not software documentation? Now, again, you know what? I thought maybe let me just uh, bring this up as a story. So as like all fairy tales, uh, this also starts with. Once upon a time in the beginning, just after the code crawled, documentation was added as an afterthought. Now, since this code was already finished, documentation was assigned lowest priority and you know, and then consequently the documentation never got done. Now nobody could use the code except the developers. And they used it poorly because they didn't remember what they had coded. So great. I mean, you know. No point in having documentation. Sadly, or eventually, there were some, you know, potential users who emerged. Now, these users were basically not developers. You know, they were somewhere else. They wrote user's manual. It was separate from the code, and it was a decent description of the user interface for the version of the code that existed like a couple of years ago. Okay. I, I mentioned that years intentionally because documentation does take time, guys. OK, now, of course, it was nearly useless to the code developer and slowly the documentation and the code drifted apart. OK, the story moves on. OK, and you know, realizing that the documentation could be useful coding tool, code developers began to use good coding practices like extensive comments. Now this documentation did not tend to wander from the code as much as it was before since it was stored with the code. However, there was a problem. The users never looked into the code for documentation. So what next? Hmm, interesting. OK, then the code developers combined documentation with coding in a way that allowed them to generate a separate source hard copy documentation and hypertext documentation from the same file documentation like was I mean there was less drift because documentation was a part of the code and users got their separate users manual and then most importantly that hypertext version allowed easy access to both code and the manual. So. 
they lived happily ever after. Well, really? Hmm. Okay, I just thought that this line would make things look good and may bring a smile on your faces. So with those smiles on, let us continue with our webinar and start discussing how we can make documentation and the process of documentation easier with automation. So what is automation? According to takeoffpedia.com, automation is the creation of application technologies to produce and deliver goods and services with minimal human intervention. Now, if you haven't noticed yet, that's me sitting on a rocket. And that's how I feel when I work on automation. Trust me, it's a fun ride. But only if you know what you need to achieve and how. Else, well, you know, you understand the kind of miseries you would actually end up going through. Uh, so, OK, so great. I know what is automation. I think I love you know, doing that stuff, but why should I do it? Now, most of you might already know this, right? I mean, you know, automation in any form will help us save time for sure. You know, get faster results. It does save money. Sometimes you don't actually have to end, you know, buying a lot more tools. Uh, maybe, you know, it might actually reduce your support costs in some cases. And most importantly, improve the ease of use. Okay, that could be your tool, that could be you know the product that you're working on, or that could probably be the process that you're probably following for you know technical documentation. It could be anything around this. Again, it is important to note that a defined repeatable process usually frees an individual from having to spend energy thinking about solved problems. But an automated one makes this even easier. OK, enough. I think that's a lot of gyan. Uh, so OK, I, I've heard you. Um, you might be thinking, OK, Aman, I mean, I've heard you. I've heard what automation is. I know that you enjoy it, but tell me, you know, what kind of skills I would need? How do I get that you know, into me? Am I am I really, uh, you know, can, can I do this? Well, you know, to start, all of you actually are doing automation or a part of it already. Trust me, that's a fact. And you'll come to know why uh, in a couple of minutes from now. It's just that you've never realized. Now, automation is definitely not a freaky, scary monster. It's kind of like a cute one. You know, just like, you know, the ones from Monsters. And aren't they cute? I love them. I love that movie. Okay. Um, I'll back. Okay. So let's take a look at this that you need to get started. You know, with any automation. Now, this is a very generic situation here. I've, I've tried to keep it as generic as possible. Now, there could be, you know, shades of, uh, I mean, there could be levels uh, of depth here. And if you have any questions, you can, you know, feel free to reach out to the DWD forum. Or if you have any specific questions, you can always reach out to me at the end of the day. So let's, at first, right? I mean, let's let's look at the skills that you look. Um, now, definitely as a technical writer or as someone who's looking to get into technical writing and is quite fascinated about the term automation, I would say you're expected to have skills to transform complex and technically difficult written material into clear and concise documentation. And that needs to be your number one skill. And if you think you cannot, I don't see any point in you going further. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not discouraging you here, but what I'm trying to say here is as a technical writer, writer takes most priority here. Now, writing is clearly a skill that you need to possess. OK, moving on, I mean, you know, say let's say, OK, fine. OK, I've been I've been trying hard. I think I have a good communication and I can do technical documentation. I've been doing that and now I'm seeing a lot of opportunities. Things are more monotonous, you know, more repetitive, and let me see what I can do. Well, great. Uh, you know, so for someone who's planning to venture into this world, uh, you know, a, a technical writing again, you know, there's this recommendation that you know, make sure that your writing and communication skills, you know, is, is is something that you concentrate on before you know automation or anything else, because I personally believe that if you lack, you know, basic writing skills, then no tool or automation can help. 
so having said that and you know uh, and and sorry if i've demoralized you guys out here but that's a fact right i mean you know we need to we need to start from there that perspective uh, and then then move on uh, okay okay writing great i've heard you aman what next well you know the next piece i think is you should be ready to learn and explore new programming tools and languages now there are like abundant of them like there, there's like there's a new language that keeps coming up like every six months now, maybe a month. I mean, you know, depending on how frequently you get introduced to those languages or, you know, you know, if you move your, you know, if you move from one organization to another, or from one technology to another technology. So, but then, you know, the idea is you should be ready to learn, at least explore these programming tools and languages. Now, again, this is a, not a mandatory skill, but think of something like you moving, into a new town or country for that matter of fact. Ask yourself, would you put in effort to know more and try to be a part of your neighborhood? You will, right? Then that's that's how this is, right? So try, try and explore these, these two technologies, these new languages and see how easy it is to just get started into, you know, and then, then become a part of that flow. Finally, uh, I think the most important one again after writing is uh, you know you need to have an ability to translate functional issues and questions into application solutions. Again, let me let me let me be very clear. This is not new. Okay, the term might probably be you know new there. The definition probably sounds like you know a definition from a science book, but. If you look, if you, if you think about this, this is this is definitely not new. It's just thinking out of the box to see what can be done to make things better. OK, we all do that in one way or other. And this is why I said you all do automation or already a part of it. OK, so enough about automation. I think uh, we've already seen what it is, uh, what it what benefits automation has and what kind of skills you know one should have or you know to at least get started with you know something like automation. I, I thought it would be good to go ahead and put a list of tools that I you know you use or have used in past for automation. Now again, trust me, all of this uh, for me automation starts with a text editor and uh, I, I'm not I'm not endorsing or branding something here, but Notepad++ is my favorite. OK, so let's quickly look at the tools that you might need to get started with, you know, a couple of automations here. Confluence, uh, you know, if, if you uh, know, so these, there are certain collaboration tools that provide macros that can help you automate certain things like Confluence gets integrated really well with Jira. It has a lot of plugins that get integrated with other environments and you can play around with, you know, the basic, you know, uh, queries within Confluence and Jira to make sure that you have uh, a page that kind of like provides you helpful information at any given point of time. Then you have Atom. Uh, that's again, you know, one of my favorite, uh, you know, uh, tool. Uh, Atom uh, is provided as as uh, an editor uh, to work with GitHub or Markdown files, but it is an open source editor, so there are a lot of packages that are available. And I'll I'll be actually using Atom today in one of my demos later part of the session. Uh, and then Google Docs, of course, uh, it's it's open source. Most of uh, us are already using Google one way or other. Uh, you know, share our presentations and stuff. It's more collaborative now. And if you if you have access to Google Suite or Gmail Suite, nothing like it. You get those uh, you know uh, documents online. And then Microsoft Office, of course, you know they have an online version as well. Moving on, a couple of graphic tools that I've used in the past. Now, all of you must have used, uh, you know, many, many of there. There are a lot, many graphic tools, and and I ch I chose to mention three of them here: uh, Plant UML, Inkscape, and Sequelix IDE. I'll be giving a quick demo on Plant UML and Sequelix IDE uh, in this webinar today. I included Inkscape because I find it to be an, you know, quite an intuitive tool. It, uh, you know, to to begin with. Uh, you can actually, you know, extract information from a PDF. You can, you know, modify information, create SVGs, uh, and and all sorts of wonders that you can do with SVG. So, and it's an open source tool. So, why not? Uh, and then, quickly moving on to example generators. So, this is something that uh, has caught up uh, in recent past. 
you know, be basically because dev code developers, as I mentioned in our story, you know, where it ends with an happily ever after statement. Uh, you know, they have actually started adding a lot more commands, a lot more meaningful information in code. And uh, instead of reinventing the wheel, uh, you know, one can actually use example generators to extract that information and then further improve, uh, you know, the process to get the desired outcome, right? So I, I have in past used doc season. Uh, Doxy REST, Natural Docs, and Sphinx. I I know that Swagger is another tool, and there are a couple more as well. I did not include them because I did not get an opportunity to work on them, so I might not be able to answer any questions. Better keep them off the list. Um, then, as the website generators, these are pretty recent ones, and then not not really recent. They have been in market for quite some time, but. Let's see, you know, we have Jekyll, we have Sphinx and Docusaurus, which is from Facebook. Quite an interesting tool there. Uh, you know, that can actually help you automate, you know, uh, generating websites uh, from text files and markdown files or directly from the source code, like use Sphinx to get that done. And then I have a bonus here. I you know, stumbled upon Story Set, uh, which is an online resource, but this actually you know, creates wonderful you know, animations, GIF animations, and it's an open source tool. So you have a lot of you know, stuff up there uh, that can be used free, of course, uh, and can be used in your presentation. So why not? So that's a couple of uh, tools here. I don't want to spend a lot of time because we have you know, demos uh, you know, going forward. Uh, okay, so quickly getting started, uh, you know, like, okay, we've covered the skills and know that there are a couple of tools that I mentioned here, but how to get started? Well, for beginners, you can, you know, start with simple batch programming on Windows or, you know, uh, shell scripts on Linux. These are simple, you know, files where you actually put commands one after the other to do certain action, one click or one go. Uh, once you start, you know, playing around with simple batch files, there are a lot of resources online, so you can definitely do a quick search there. Uh, once you get acquainted with, you know, working on batch files or shell scripts, uh, you can move on to Visual Basic scripts or JavaScript, which basically are a little more advanced, give you more ability of actually adding variables and all the other stuff. There are a lot of uh, resources there. I love playing with Visual Basic scripts because it actually adds, you know, voice and, you know, text to speech conversion engines and all sorts of funny stuff. Uh, then we have HTML application, which is HTA. I'm not sure if you have actually encountered this, but I personally like this. It kind of like makes a web page, uh, you know, a converts a web page into an application, kind of like comes quite handy during product demonstrations. So if you're working on a website, uh, XSLT is an expats, of course. Uh, now that's in an order where I, I mentioned XSLT is an expats because, uh, you know, we, we are moving towards data based documentation and uh, uh, XSLT and XPath play a crucial role in the background, so you can actually change uh, the way you interact with your data code. You can, you know, actually do wonders. You know, you can automate you know, a lot of stuff if you have understanding of XPath, and they do come handy when you are actually working on schema drones. Now, that's for some other day, for sure. Uh, and then Python, Perl, or any other language that you can do, which basically provides packages or modules that can be readily used to get things done on Windows or Linux, or for that matter of fact, any other operating system. So depending on you know where you want to get started, I mean the level of uh, you know understanding you have with the programming, uh, you know you can go ahead and pick up one area and then start improving yourself in that area. OK, so we are here, uh, you know, when I need to you know, go ahead and, uh, you know, share quick demo. So what I'm good, uh, what I'll be doing here is I'll be demonstrating how to automate image capturing, which definitely is one of the, you know, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, I find it really challenging working on technical documents which have images and, you know, you know, developers keep changing stuff in GUI and then, you know, you have to go through all of that. So. OK, I'll get into that details you know, in, in a couple of seconds here. Uh, so I'll be talking about how to automate image capturing. I'll be talking about diagram generation, which is really fascinating. Trust me, guys. And I'll also be talking about how to create HTML applications. So let's quickly go to our first demo. Uh, automating image capture. The tool that I use is SQLy or SQLix. SQLix is basically an IDE, it's an integrated development environment. Uh, it basically automates anything you see on a screen, you know, on your desktop computer, running Windows, Mac, or Linux or Unix, any version of them. 
basically, you know, it gets its power from OpenCV and, you know, and, uh, to identify GUI components. And it does, trust me, guys, it does come, you know, quite a lot handy when you are actually trying to do automation uh, and stuff that is like redundant, especially when you're writing tasks and you want to ensure that the feature or the product, if it's a GUI based or maybe browser based as well, uh, hasn't changed anything. Right? So, and and you want to capture those screenshots maybe on an you know uh, on a nightly basis or maybe a weekly basis. So, automation. Uh, I mean, the possibility of automation with SQLX is endless. It's just that you know you need to put your imagination and see what you can do. What I have done here for today is I have created a, a, a SQLX code, which is basically based out of Python. You can use JavaScript or Python yeah, in SQLX IDE. So I've used Python here to create or to basically open a Word document, type some text in a Word document, and then save it with a specific name. OK, so having said that, let me quickly uh, um, see if I can actually start sharing my other desktop here. Um, so let me switch to a different desktop. OK, so can you guys see my desktop again? Yeah, I'm visible. Thank you. OK, so this is SQLX. Uh, the idea with this code is, you know, uh, you know, as you can see here, it'll click the start button on my PC. Uh, it'll type a word, word, which basically means launching the word application. You can even launch a word application. You can give the program name here. Uh, I just wanted it to stretch a bit, uh, and then you know, you know, provide keystrokes that you want, and then you know, do actions within the application. Like I want to open a blank document, so this is the uh, icon here. So let me just go ahead and uh, first, uh, you know, show you how this works. Uh, so there's a run, there's a run and a run slow motion. So what I'm going to do here is I'll click the run button and let's see, you know, how things, uh, you know, come up. So here we go. So the, the start button is highlighted. My cursor now click the start button. It should type the word word now. It did hit and enter, so my Microsoft Word launches. Now it will try to find the blank document, so it's going to highlight that area. It identified it. It'll click on that, and then it'll type the text that I provided uh, in the script. Now I'm not typing; my hands are up here in the air. Okay, so uh, so it basically does that job for me. And now once this is done, I want it to find the file. It did. Click on file and then click on save. It did. And then click on documents. Enter a file name. And click save. OK, so my script is done running. As you can see, you know, no errors here. Now you might wonder what I also did was like I was not just you know running the script. I was also capturing each action here, and that was automatic, right? So I was basically capturing each action you know before it was performed so that I can keep a track of what has changed in my product. Now this is just one of the example. Imagine like you know you can probably you know I, I, I've, I've added all the links to these tools here, so you can actually look at the potential of this tool and then you know. You know, work on automation uh, to whatever magnitude you want to. So let's see if the images were captured. Yes, the images were captured. So yeah, there you go, right? So the images by default go into um, you know the temp folder, but there is a command that you can actually set to uh, uh, you know change the default path. So here's the image here. Let me just quickly open the image. So this is the first image where you know I opened the word and blank document. Then type you know after I've actually typed the information I wanted it to capture the screen, it did that. And then you know uh, again, I think this is oh yeah, it's actually it's actually taken a screenshot where I was actually about to click the save button. Uh, it did that. And then you know when you know it was entering the name, and that's it. So this is the second time I ran the script here. So basically, the idea is that you are not just automating you know 
the tool the way you know you want the tool to work like you have a design you create a you know a, a gui regression design that's what i call this this is what uh, could, could be a good name for this uh, but then you can also capture screenshots and then push these screenshots you know, uh, maybe on a nightly basis to your project location so that the screenshots are always updated right so so the possibility uh, you know are endless here and i find this tool really helpful especially keeping the screenshots um, pretty much updated and live uh, so i have a couple of examples that i have shared with the twt forum so when you get uh, so you're going to get a package where i am sharing this script here as well as you know the other scripts that i have worked on so this one uh, basically uh, you know, works on uh, launching a Chrome application and then go to Microsoft.com and then you know do some action there. Uh, so all these scripts will be made available to you. The link uh, to download SQLX IDE is made available. SQLX IDE is an open source tool, so there's uh, so you can go ahead and install it. It's a simple jar file with certain dependencies. You need to download those dependencies and you're good to go. Uh, the file is really, you know, uh, small and it could just stay in any of your folders. It doesn't get installed. It's a jar file. So you basically need Java uh, to be installed on your PC to run this. OK, so that was uh, about uh, SQLix. I'll quickly move on to our presentation again and see where we were. OK, so so about that. And OK, so my next demo was uh, basically uh, on uh, sorry. OK, generating diagram uh, and automating diagram generation. Now trust me, this uh, you know usually comes handy when I'm talking to a developer usually and discussing a feature, right? So in this case, uh, the idea is that we are developing a bank application and then you know the developer is trying to explain to me, you know how you know the whole interactions takes place and you know what happens uh, when you know the user logs in or you know what happens and how that information is passed on to the bank servers and stuff like that. Well. I, you know, I, I definitely took notes about it, but I thought maybe I can, you know, go ahead and, uh, you know, write it in such a way that I can generate the flow diagram. Okay, now that's interesting, right? Because what you're basically doing is just writing information here. So I said, okay, so this is a system context diagram for internet banking system. That's my title. And as per the discussion, I was informed that there's probably going to be two, uh, you know, interactions here. One from the customer, and the other one is a banking system. So the person is a customer. Uh, he's basically a customer of a bank with personal bank accounts. And then the system, which is a banking system, I call it the Internet Banking System. And you know, a brief description about what it does. Then what I'm actually doing here is I'm actually providing interactions as to what actually happens when the customer does. So there is an uh, there is an external system, which is a mail system here, which basically is the internal Microsoft Exchange email system. And then there is a mainframe banking system, which basically takes care of all the interactions between customer banking system and mail systems. Now, talking about the use case here. So what is happening here is there is, a, you know, there is a relationship between customer and the banking system, which it says uses. So the customer uses a banking system and then what he gets back is you know the mail system sends an email to customer so you know uh, relationship back basically tells like what happens you know afterwards like you know so this is your user one this is your user two and what happens you know in the back so the arrow points back to the customer from user two to user one and relationship basically is an arrow towards you know from user one to user two then there is a neighbor, which is basically the next system. So I just want to show another block of banking system and how banking system interacts with mail system. OK, and what format it uses and then how the whole banking system works. Uh, might sound a little bit, uh, you know, confusing in the first place, but then trust me when you start working on this and you start, you know, when, when you have your hands on these commands, uh, you know, things become really easier. So let's go ahead. So this is Atom editor that I've used. Uh, Atom provides plugins, uh, packages, and I've installed the uh, plant UML preview package, uh, which basically helps me generate the SVG or PNG out of this text here. Yes, that's true. Let's see what happens. Uh, toggle plant ML preview. There you go. I did not draw this. Trust me, I didn't do that. 
OK, now if you don't trust me here, let me go ahead and change something. Uh, so instead of customer, let me call him Man. OK, and I'll just go ahead and save this file. And there you go. There you go. You see that? So basically this is an image. OK, and then you know there's an output format. You can generate an SVG or an PNG. OK, but then this image is generated. OK, because you know PlantML is already installed offline on your PC now. Uh, this this image is generated using these PlantML commands. So there you go. You now have a flow diagram either to be included in your documentation or maybe to share, you know that you can share with your developer and ask him. You no, know, is this what we discussed the other day? Uh, is this how the system works? I'm pretty sure he's going to, you know, like the way you present that information. And imagine you can actually save this file right with the code. Okay, so the developer can actually open this file and say, well, you know what? This is not a month. This is customer. Okay, I've changed this to customer, and that's it. What I just need to do is open this file, preview this, and that's it. My SVG is now automated to customer. I just go ahead and upload this image onto my you know, documentation system. Great, right? I have another example that I'm, you know, uh, that I've added. Let me just go ahead and quickly open it. This is more complex. This one is a simple one. This one is a little bit more complex here. This basically brings in more modules uh, and more systems into place. So let's see what happens here. There you go. So this one basically is showing you an entire system of how a customer interacts within a bank system. And then you know there is a legend as well. So all of this not using Visio, not using Inkscape, only using text. How cool is that? Right? OK, so I'm shipping these examples. I mean, I've included these uh, examples as a part of a package so that you should you should get when you know, you're getting the presentation for this webinar. Uh, so don't worry to take notes here. You'll get these examples and then you know, you'll get all the information in the slides. You can download this tool. This is again an open source tool. Atom is open source. Uh, Plant UML plugin is also package is also an open source. So you can just right away go ahead and play and it takes about like 10 minutes to configure everything on your PC. Well, great. OK, Aman, that was good. That was great. Plant ML. Uh, so in the interest of time, like I'll probably go ahead further uh, with creating HTML applications. Uh, I actually intentionally added this here because uh, most of us are, I, I'm assuming that most of us love playing with HTML files, right? Uh, you know, either, you know, we are learning the, you know, HTML tags kind of like form a base to uh, any other markup language that I've, I've come across, right? I mean, XML has a couple of HTML tags, uh, use as is P or, you know, uh, you know, B or I or U or any of that sort. So I, I love playing with HTML. You know, my daughter, she's eight, she's learning HTML right now. So she loves playing it because it kind of like gives her ability to color and you know insert images and whatnot stuff and you know with a with lot ease. So we do that. However, the idea is not just to have HTML, but to convert that into a fully functional standalone application. How cool would be that? OK, so what I've done here is I borrowed an example from the technetmicrosoft.com script center. I usually keep visiting them here. Uh, and the script that I'm actually using today for this demo is. Uh, OK, so I have three examples here. The first example, so as you can see here, this is not an HTML page. It's actually a fully functional standalone application. So you need to zip it, share it, and it starts working on their PC. OK, so this is this is more like you know, archiving your HTML files together and making it more standalone. Uh, you can also encrypt. By the way, you can also encrypt the code within this HTA file. So if someone even opens the HTML, he would not be able to identify what code you've actually written. So uh, it provides the encryption capabilities as well. Uh, this is from Microsoft, so it usually works only on Windows. I'm sorry, Linux users. I couldn't find an alternative uh, that could work on Linux or Unix, or maybe there is a package or plugin or something that I'm not aware of. OK, so quickly, uh, example one, as you can see here, this is a simple HTML, which basically says heading and a paragraph. Let me open this uh, using Atom and see what the code is. So here you go. The code is pretty much HTML, 
if you are aware of HTML. The only thing that changes here is I've added this line here. It says it's an HTA application and provided an application name, which basically appears when you launch the window. So there you go. The title is basically your HTM, HTA name. OK, rest everything is basically HTML. Now when I'm saying HTML, HTML supports a lot of other scripts, JavaScripts for that matter of fact. So I have another example here, which basically is taking a number and then you know converting it, you know, into uh, actually say yeah, and then you know it's basically you know check to find if it's a prime number or not. There's a basic JavaScript uh, that I've actually added here, so that's example two. Now let me say three. Check yes, three is a prime number. Four, check. No, four is not a prime number. Now imagine this. I am not launching this in a browser. This is all standalone here and close, right? Now imagine the possibilities that you can have. I found this really interesting. So here's an example from Script Center. I don't have copyright, so I've retained everything as is, and the code is also you know made available as a part of package. So see here, I can actually you know create menus in my standalone application. Now imagine the possibility that I have to create these menus and provide links to various resources that I access usually. Now I know that there are bookmarks, there are other you know tools that you can use, but how about having one standalone application that could provide links to all your applications? How cool would be that? Right, so so here you know I, I'm I'm leaving it to you and to your imagination as to how you want to take this automation further. But trust me, when I talk about automation, usually I say sky is the limit, guys. Trust me, you know you you can go ahead to any extent. It all depends on your vision. It all ex it depends on your experience, and it all you know depends on what you want to achieve. OK, so there is no limit to it. And you know if you if there is a situation where you're struggling with a repetitive process, there's no harm in going ahead and trying to research and see if there's already a tool available. And if there is, I don't think anyone is actually stopping you from using it. Go ahead, explore it. If you can't do that on your official PC, get you know a, try to do that on your personal laptop. Uh, explore it and then see how best you can actually you know how you can fine tune that repetitive process. Bring that to your management and tell them, you know, how cool would that be to, you know, change, you know, or bring this automation into the system and how you can save time or money in some cases, or maybe make things a lot easier for your customers. Go ahead and do that. Well, that was pretty much for the presentation today. Thank you very much for being patient, uh, listeners, and uh, you know, giving me this time and opportunity. So please, in case if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on my personal email address. Uh, a link to my LinkedIn account is also made available on this slide. Thank you very much. Back to you, Pallavi. That was incredible. Awesome. And uh, I am already getting some messages saying that it's magical, it's good, and whatnot. Even I, frankly speaking, didn't even think that automation could do. I mean, we could do so much things with, uh, you know, this uh, writing scripts and uh, everything. Thank you so much, Aman, for your presentation. We are ready to take questions. Uh, yeah, Pallavi. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so can I start with my question? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Amin. That was a, a wonderful presentation. And uh, I wanted to ask you about this automating image capture. So you had shown us the tool how to capture uh, the images automatically and all those stuffs. But in video creation also, we do the same thing, right? So in what way it is different? Uh, when we create a video in Camtasia, what we do is capture the screenshots, give a voiceover, and uh, that's how it goes on, right? So, yeah. So. Well, that's 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 a good question. Thank you. Uh, so in, in this case, right in, in a video capturing tool, what we basically do is we already know the story. We know the flow uh, pretty much. And then, you know, we basically capture the screen or we just do that. We imitate it manually. We click on the buttons manually. We you know do the stuff, you know, uh, and then try to capture the video might add in you know, a couple of comments here and there and make it a movie. 
in this case, I'm not doing anything manually, right? I'm, I'm not clicking on any buttons. I am not doing anything. What I'm doing here is I'm giving a use case. That's what discussed with my developer. Now my developer told me you need to do this, 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 then this in my product in the, in the product. So what I'm just doing here is I'm capturing those snippets from the product, like the buttons that I need to you know, click. I'm, I'm throwing those buttons as uh, as as you know small bits of information uh in in my script and i'm asking my script to do everything and while doing that it's actually capturing all the screens so uh, so i can do this even if i'm not in front of my pc i can do this at any given point of time and if 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 taken to a better you know i would actually say automation system like jenkins or any other this can be done in the background at the build level itself OK, so basically this is more like a GUI regression uh, and and uh, ensuring that you always have anything. Now the script might break if something changes because you throw an uh, image. Uh, the script basically is trying to find that image using OpenCV GUI you know, uh, uh, scripts or algorithms. Now if it doesn't find that specific snippet, the script will throw an error. So you'll come to know that something has changed on your screen something is probably modified and that's when you need to go back and start probing it so it's basically a regression testing as well and uh, not just a screen capturing tool hope i have answered great, your question great. yeah great thank you, uh, thank you so much. Uh, i am follow up question to follow up question with uh, chandralekha sorry um, can i go ahead this is sure, please. yes yes, yes. Yeah, so just a follow up question. So uh, what you uh, when you opened your sentence for the image capture thing, you said the uh, UIs keep changing and uh, based on your explanation, you said there are specific elements that act like pointers or identifiers that you use to capture the screen. Uh, so that means you have to be well versed with the UI to come up with the script. That's one question, whether you have to know the complete UI, how it functions in order to come up with the script. And second thing is uh, when the code breaks, when it's not able to identify a certain identifier or pointer, how do we mitigate that? You know, we can can you help me with that question? Sure. Well, uh, to answer your first question, yes, you need to uh, definitely understand the flow, and that's where the whole test case thing comes. Like, uh, you know, uh, let me put an example here. I want to go ahead and create a new project, right? I mean, I have a product. Uh, you know, the, the task is creating a new project. Now, I need to understand how to create a new project before I can go ahead and write a script. So, uh, so definitely, yes. I need to understand the flow. I need to make sure that everything is in place before I create the script. And this is a one time effort unless you know something changes in the new project wizard. Uh, so let's assume that something changed in the new project wizard. The script throws an error. Now I can definitely go ahead and automate you know, the error. I can pick the error and uh, throw an you know an, an, an email or a notification to you know respective you know people or you know whosoever is involved in the whole process and tell them well you know your regression did not pass because there are a couple of errors and trust me the, the errors can i mean you can clearly point as to like what basically changed in your script because the error actually tells you the exact location where that thing went wrong and you can go back to their process and see you know why that didn't work okay so there's some change there Yes, there are notification possibilities as well, uh, and and you know you can further improve the scripting to probably take it to a level where you want. I mean, you know, the notification to be generated or uh, whatsoever. So, but you know, so the idea is the possibilities are endless here. Okay, so does your preparation start by understanding the build, or does it start after once the build is rendered as a UI? Like, I'm just trying to map it as a non-technical user. Like, do I have to understand the UI for it to function, or do I have to understand at the build level to come up with the script? Well, I would say this is more of an UI-based tool, so you definitely need to understand how that UI works. Okay, okay, so you need to have those conversations with the developer for sure to be able to come up with this test case, the, the GUI regression test case or the screen capture okay. capability. Yes. Thanks, Amandeep. This was great. Sure, sure, man. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have a question from Kalpana. Uh, can you give a small demo or how it works of automatic uh, example generation using deoxygen or any other tool? I guess that would be. Uh, a long one. Yeah, that that would definitely be. And uh, you know, if I if I'm not wrong, um, uh, I mean, you might 
want to correct me, Pallavi, but I've already done this demonstration yeah. maybe, you know, a couple of weeks back, um, a couple of months back, maybe last year. So maybe you can share that uh, a link to that demo to, you know, the participant, um, you know, and, you know, and then she can further follow up with me as to like, you know, I mean, what the requirements are. I, I might be able to better help her out with any specific automation that she may have. He or she yeah. may have. Uh, Kalpana, yes, uh, I'm Amin had presented uh, with the oxygen, I suppose, right? With uh, Correct. So, yes. Yeah, we do yes. have that link. Uh, please connect offline so that uh, probably we can share that with you. Uh, sure, Balavi. Thanks. Okay, we have any other question? Uh, Pallavi, I had a question. Anindita here. Yeah. Uh, Amman, you mentioned when you were showing us script uh, you you mentioned capturing the yeah. element like the blank document or file that region uh, now suppose my uh, the region to be captured i have to scroll a bit on my um, screen to capture that region how does how does the script take care of that part so if the if that region is not uh, visible at first instance i have to scroll down and click somewhere yes okay. is that so possible it is yes. I mean, you know, you can actually use uh, keys. Uh, so there is a you know down key, or you know, uh, you can also oh, okay. use scroll okay. functionality. Okay. So yes, I mean, you know, the number of scrolls you want to do, and just hit those key down commands in your script, and it'll go to those levels. And then you know, once the option appears on your screen, you can capture it. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. That answers my question. Sure. Awesome. Okay, we have one more question uh, that's from Swati Krishna. Is it possible to automate a screen capture using a Snagit tool and to, to edit uh, to a defined size and automatically insert in a frame maker tool? Uh, I, uh, I've, I've used Snagit, but I haven't used the latest versions of it, so I do not understand if they have bought this functionality into the tool. I haven't looked into that part. Now, Snagit is basically a paid application. I mean, you definitely need to pay, you know, or, or buy licenses for Snagit. And uh, I'm sorry to mention this. I'm not against any of the tools that basically, you know, you need to buy, but I usually look out for open source alternatives because one is like, uh, one, for sure they're open source. Two is like the community support is great. You can always go ahead ask questions your own specific requirements and there's someone out there who would definitely come back with an answer that best applies to your query or to your situation so it kind of like works really well in an open source environment uh, so i'm not sure if i can actually answer the question on snagit but i i would love to go ahead and explore it maybe read the features and see if this could be a possibility there Awesome. Swati Krishna, I guess this answers your question. Uh, probably you can just try it yourself and see how it works. Uh, the script yeah, is always and, provided by Aman. Yeah, and, and do let me know if that works. Okay, yeah. please. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, yeah, any, I don't see any more questions. Uh, uh, hi, yes, this is Mohan. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for Amandi. Yes, Mohan, please go on. Hi, uh, hi, Mindy. Uh, firstly, uh, a big thanks for this session. I think it's uh, it's been a, a very knowledgeable session. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, relating to you mentioned about the workflow diagrams getting generated automatically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so can some of these plugins be integrated with uh, uh, a Microsoft Visio or a Microsoft PowerPoint to generate workflow diagrams automatically? That's my question one. And uh, based on your experience, uh, what do you feel is you know the the amount of time that's going to get invested in learning this whole uh, scripting and you know and what is the cost savings you know, from an effort standpoint? So so it's a twofold question. Our question, Amandeep. Really good questions, Mohan. Thanks for asking. Um, you know, so for to answer your first question, the workflow diagram, uh, plant UML is an open source. It is shipped as plugins. Now, uh, my, the the tools that you have asked for are Microsoft. Uh, tools, uh, they usually do not open their source. So I, you know, it would be difficult to answer if, you know, be, you know, uh, 
plant UML can be integrated with Microsoft Visual. I've actually not thought about that. Uh, you know, so basically the uh, you know what I use plant ML as you know as a as a part of a text editor. Usually, when I'm having a conversation with a developer, I am basically taking notes, which is usually in a text rather than drawing it. I mean, I can definitely do that, but I find it a lot easier to write the text and probably you know instructions one after the other. Uh, the idea with plant ML is you carry those instructions and add a couple of tags and then you start getting that flow diagram generated and uh, autumn uh, as as you know, does a great job both of I mean as I mentioned autumn and plant UML they both open source kind of like integrate really well so it shouldn't take you a lot of time and effort to you know get get into you know this mode uh, with Microsoft issue I haven't tried it I do not I do not know if that capability is possible I can definitely take a note do a quick research and and uh, share my, uh, you know, observations uh, with you or with the T, uh, the TWT forum. Uh, uh, to answer your second question, uh, it's about the learning time. I would say uh, this answer is, uh, I mean, I cannot go ahead and give you a generic answer, right? I mean, for me, uh, I can go ahead and do this like in like and let us say a complex one, maybe in 30 minutes, but that could not be a case with someone else, right? So if someone is starting, right? I mean, if someone is starting afresh right now, trying to understand, I would say one has to spend time looking into the various tags that are available and that can be used in plant ML, and that's a learning curve, definitely. Uh, two is like use an, you know, use Atom to, you know, try those tags and see which one basically fits into his requirement. So that's another exercise. Uh, and once you start doing that, you kind of like get acquainted with the tags that you need to use, and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, basically, you know, your your learning, you know, goes to you know that that level where you understand how to you know put that information in a format that could generate the uh, the diagram. I mean, basically, the possibilities are endless. I mean, I've, I've mentioned in my slide that you just cannot, you can generate timing diagrams, sequence diagrams, use cases, and all sorts of stuff with the plant UML. So it all depends on. You know what diagram you want to generate and how complex that whole thing is. Uh, the learning usually takes about a week if you are actually dedicatedly you know looking at plant ML as a solution. And uh, coming to the uh, cost, uh, I would say since it's an open source tool and it kind of like generates uh, renders you know pretty good SVGs. Trust me, and maintenance is really low. Your developers can actually go and edit the text file and change information. Uh, you don't actually have to buy licenses for your developers, right? So uh, it kind of like reduces cost as well in a, in a way. If uh, you know you have documentation which are diagram heavy, and they usually you know are changed or you usually go through a change. Um, so I hope I have actually answered your questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think that's that answers my question. Thank you, Mohan. Awesome. So, any more questions? We still have a couple of, <clears throat> uh, yeah, 10 15 minutes probably. Okay. Right now, I think we all are just dazed, you know, trying to sink in all this information. <laughs> Eventually, we'll come up with more questions. At least for me, I'm I'm, I'm feeling this, right? So sure, much yeah. to sick in. Totally, it is, right? Yeah. It, yeah. Is, it is really wonderful. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, Aman, for sharing this knowledge with us. And we look forward for many such uh, uh, for sessions with you, for learning sessions with you. Thank you so much. And over to you, Puneet. I think Pallavi we need so uh, one two such webinars with Aman uh, for uh, we better uh, uh, you know start with the course learning session. Yes, yes, <laughs> Aman yes. we Sitch have to start. Yes. Us types. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you everyone for attending TWT's session. Uh, Puneet, you'd like to take over. Thank you. Thanks, Aman. So all has already been said, and this was a uh, such a quick and fast session, you know, you were on a roll. So one by one, it was, I think, so well explained. So no wonder everybody is full of praise. And I'm sure those who haven't tried automation will feel motivated. That's the main intention of a session, that people who feel that automation is like not our cup of tea should go back 
and try something and then use the forums for discussion. So thank you so much, Aman. Thanks, Valui, for hosting and thanks everybody for attending. So we will catch up next week again where we have two webinars and uh, we will be sharing the feedback form. Please do fill the feedback form and once you click, as I mentioned, you will see the links for the material that Aman has shared and also for the YouTube link. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amal. Thank you.